Thank you, Lisa. Yay. Of course, we have to say it, right? Happy New Year, friends. We pray that this first 11 hours of 2017 have gone wonderfully well for you. And in fact, the fact that you're here on this holiday morning represents a strength of commitment and a desire to invite God into the leading and guiding of your life. So we are blessed to have you here. Welcome to Sycamore. Uh, one of our ushers left me a note um, this morning underneath the, uh, the drawing, uh, Who Am I? The caption here, which shows track going in various directions, and they simply put Ohio State question mark. <laughs> I get it. Um, I knew I'd have to comment somehow. Um, I knew I would say I didn't recognize the team that was on the field, but I take heart in the fact that was last year. <laughs> so kindly use the friendship pads as a way of helping us be better mindful of those who are with us this morning. We have a couple of things we just would love to highlight for you. If you're with us this day and you do not have a congregational home in the greater Cincinnati area, we encourage you to make Sycamore your church home. Uh, we're offering a new members class on February the 25th. That is a Saturday. It is a morning class and all you need to do is to contact the main office to register. Our office is closed tomorrow in observance of the New Year's holiday. We also want to share that there is one on-call adult needed for the toddler room for one Sunday each month. And if you might be able to share and you'd get all the benefits of being with our little ones, uh, please let Jan Ferris know. <clears throat> I apologize, I don't sound particularly well this morning, although I feel great. Uh, my voice is often the last thing to improve, so um, I am not contagious or anything like that. I'm just sounding kind of rough. And we also want to remind you that there comes a time when all of the beautiful trappings of Christmas and the decorations need to go back into their rightful places. We'll be doing that this Thursday gathering at 9 a.m. in the cafe area if you might be willing and able to lend your own heart to helping us undecorate uh, our church space. In any event, we are blessed to have you here this day, and may we now prepare our hearts to worship God. As we begin this worship, will you join me with a word of prayer? A new day has dawned, a new year begun. The world turns to hopes and dreams of the future. O oh Lord, keep us in your ways and on your path as we enter this new year with hope and excitement. O oh Lord, guide us as we look to you and we worship you. Amen. I invite you to stand and join in singing our opening song, The Church's One Foundation.
as we join together as this community to profess our sins before a just and loving God. Lord, we come to you on this new day, new year. We seek your grace for all the things we have done wrong in the past against you and against our neighbors. Lord, relieve us of our fears. Give us a new heart and a new spirit. Make us a generous people of our time and our gifts. Have mercy on us, Lord, and let your forgiveness and love come down on this day after day. Lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. The resurrection changes everything. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven because of God's abundant grace. morning is a reading from the psalm. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit at the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The word of the Lord.
Friends, you need to know this. After the first service, I had someone stop me who is a music professional. And they said, you cannot possibly imagine what a difficult piece that is. And they said, let me tell you this. I saw the music, and I'll tell you, I'll never attempt it. So, Su Jin, for you to give us a gift like that on a morning like this, how we want to say thank you, and how great thou art. Absolutely. Wow. Please join with me in a moment of prayer. Hmm. Lord Jesus, may we testify to your greatness by the loving offering of our lives. For we ask it in your holy name. Amen. All of us want to feel that we have a life that matters. And that would be a great gift to receive this year. A sense that your life counts. That together we have an opportunity to be influential. To make a difference. To know that we have something to be cherished. A lot of times we spend great energy on wanting to demonstrate to the world around that our life is just like that. <clears throat> that our life matters. That it counts, that it's important, that it's elevated. And sometimes we try to do that by attaching ourselves to a variety of different trappings, things that we believe might validate our importance, the significance of who we are. We just do it. Trappings come in many shapes and sizes. Sometimes the trappings of our life may have to do with wanting to look or appear a different way. It may be reflected in the clothing that we wear. In fact, sometimes we might feel like our clothing elevates our status. And I gotta tell you this, because my wife has worked for a dozen years for Snooty Fox, I am quite accustomed to wearing very nice clothing at ridiculously cheap prices. And so that one's been lost on me. That sometimes our clothing is a way we try to elevate our sense of importance. Sometimes it is the homes that we choose to live in. Perhaps may send a message to the world that we're successful. That we've arrived. That we've gotten it right. I love my wife dearly. And often, late at night, there are particular kinds of shows she enjoys watching. And sometimes they are the kinds of programs where a couple is looking for a property to buy, perhaps in a resort area or on an island, or they're trying to decide whether to rehab their house or just list it. I'm often struck by some of those conversations because I consider myself to be a novice. I'm not real sophisticated in this arena, but many times it has to do with the finishing touches on homes. And I'll hear people often say, oh, I'm not interested in that house that doesn't have granite countertops. There aren't any stainless steel appliances. It doesn't have the right look. We're not going to go there. Well, I've come to the awareness that perhaps some of the cultural fascination with things like granite countertops and stainless steel appliances may actually date when decorating was done. But it's not right or wrong necessarily. It's just what people seem to like at an era of time. But we want to show that we've got the right stuff. 
I was struck recently, though, when someone shared with me that they were pulling out all of their appliances that are fairly new. And I said, well, is there anything wrong with them? No, no, we just don't like the fact they're not stainless. We want to have stainless. No, it's their right. They can pay for it. It's not an issue. But what becomes an issue for me is that's kind of a privileged type of problem. And where is there a corresponding attentiveness to those who perhaps have substandard appliances or whose appliances don't work or don't work very well or who may not even have them? Are we able to honor that part of the conversation? Because sometimes we can get lost in the trappings. I'll tell you in all sincerity, I was kind of taken back a step one day when someone spoke to me very candidly and said, I was, I was surprised to see the car you were driving when you came into work this morning. It's the same car I always drive. And they said, well, I really expected you to pull up at a great big black Buick. And I said, well, that's really not me. And I said, honestly, we don't put a lot of extra money into vehicles. We want them to be in good running order. But anything that is a little extra, we like to save away for travel. That's really where we like to splurge if we're going to splurge anywhere. Okay. Well, I still, I expected to see you in that great big car. And I guess there was a sense that as the head of staff at a church like Sycamore, they really believe their leader ought to have these kinds of trappings. I don't know if that bothered them. I think it might have. Sometimes, you know, we actually compare churches to each other and say that one might be more prestigious than another. One has a bigger budget, one has bigger attendance, one has better programming. I've heard those conversations. And maybe someone just felt that their head of staff needed to be driving a better car. But see, trappings can come up empty. We try to validate our importance in a lot of ways, and sometimes it's by our affiliations. If we have the right network, then we can show that we are not only well-connected, but we've been successful, and that our life matters. God love him. It pained me once to have a conversation with my father following a time of some bipolar instability. He said, yes, I've made my application to Mensa. Now, Mensa, some of you know, is kind of an academic think tank for the very bright. I have no issue with Mensa. I don't know if I would be accepted, but that's not the issue. What I sensed was for my dad to have the affiliation of potentially being a part of a group like Mensa would show that he had it all together, that he was all right, that his life was now important, valuable. And I ached for him knowing that there were so many challenges. Sometimes our affiliations have to do with the clubs or connections that we have. I often wince when someone needs to let me know how many degrees they have. Because ultimately you are not your degrees. But yet something in that communication might say, well, you should treat me as someone who is very well established and very mentally agile. But that's really not what it's all about, is it? Sometimes we like family affiliations that might appear to be prestigious. I grew up here. My family has done this. 
God love her. I remember my long departed mother early in our relationship before Joyce and I, I think we're even married. She told Joyce, she said, I could get you into the daughters of the American Revolution. Joyce didn't say much. You know, on my mother-in-law's side, the family was predominantly from Czechoslovakia or Austria. So I think my mother was sharing something that she felt was prestigious. But what she didn't know is that on my wife's father's side, there was a family member who'd been a part of the House of Burgess. And I've just learned a whole lot about him in the last month because it tailored its way into a Christmas gift. Going back about 10 generations, she would have a great, 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 great grandfather named Joshua Fry. Now Joshua Fry, and this is cool, was commander of the Virginia Regiment, prelude to the Continental Army back in the 1750s. Serving under him as a second in command was a person whose name probably sounds familiar. His second in command was a person named George Washington. Joshua Fry fell off of a horse and sustained a mortal injury which allowed George Washington to ascend. Fascinating. George Washington gave the eulogy at Joyce's great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather's funeral. They've now turned the old homestead into a bed and breakfast. And so we can stay in the Joshua Fry suite. It'll be fun. And she's the direct connect, not me. I tell you all that just knowing though ultimately we are not our affiliations. Although sometimes they may make us feel extra special. The one writer about Joshua Fry referred to him as being luckless. I find that a curious definition of an individual who did so many significant things, not luckless. We are luckless if we fail to grasp that our life mattering means that it must be about more than us. Because the focus today is on who am I? And at my very worst, I can tell you, well, who I am is just Larry. And like every other person, Larry has his share of missed connections, of quirks, of blind spots, of things that I don't get right, of failures, like everybody else. At my worst, I'm just Larry. But who am I at my best? At my best, I am Larry, who is child of God, transformed by the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, made into something bigger than myself and grander than I could ever earn with higher education or in the workforce. It's a gift from God. At my best, I have to remember that to answer the question, who am I, I have to be able to answer the question, whose am I? Because who I belong to has a whole lot to say about who I am at my best. The psalmist put it in pretty succinct terminology, talking about blessed is the person who really takes the counsel of the law of God. That person becomes like a tree and the streams of water always seem to undergird it and nourish it and keep it growing and alive. You see, that law of God is not a burden. It is a point of great freedom. 
And it's a way of remembering who I am and who God is. And there's a difference. But at my best, it's about God inhabiting and enveloping my life and making me and transforming me into something I could never be on my own. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to ask for a volunteer. I really did want to do that, but it will also save me money because my goal was to actually use a $20 bill as an enticement for somebody to come up and help me make a point. But that would take longer than we have time for in this service today. So I'm going to try to recreate this thing for you visually. And you'll get it. Presume I have a $20 bill. Actually, I've left my wallet in my office, so I don't have anything right now. But just for the sake of a conversation, I have a $20 bill. And I'm going to invite you to come up. And if you answer all the questions correctly, you get to keep the $20. Now, what can you do with $20? Okay, you can maybe buy eight gallons of gas. Well, that'll get you at least up to Columbus and back. It'll undergird a few trips to Starbucks for you and maybe someone you care about. It might take four or five people out to lunch at McDonald's. I mean, 20 bucks is 20 bucks. Now, it is legal tender, so I will only disrespect it orally. I won't actually do this to the $20 bill. But presume that I had a $20 bill and then I folded it up real nice and neatly so it was just a little eensy weensy thing. And I asked you, what can you do now with the $20 bill? Well, I can still spend it and it'll be worth $20. Right answer. Good. Now what if I took the $20 bill and I crinkled it all up? I mean, I made it into something like a ball. Once again, I won't do that because it's legal tender. But if I did it and I handed you that $20 bill that's now a ball, what could you do with it? You could probably unfold it and it would still have $20 worth of purchasing power for you. And you'd get to keep the bill because you'd said all the right things. Why do we feel differently about our lives? Many of us think our lives have lost their value because they have been creased. They may feel like they've gotten reduced in scope or size. Perhaps they've gotten all balled up somehow and aren't nearly as attractive as we think they once were. And correspondingly, we imagine that now our life has lost something of its value. Not true. Especially if during that period where you have gone through some bumps and bruises and challenges and heartaches, you have been willing to lean more readily into the love and grace of God, which validates your worth and establishes the currency for your life that ultimately counts. That one was just off the cuff. That one just kind of flowed in there. The currency of your life, that's really pretty good. I like that. Wish I'd have thought of that at 9.15. The Lord is not going to allow your life to be devalued by the creases the challenges, the disfigurements that occur. It still has incredible spending power and potential if we allow it to be released into the love and grace of God. There's no limit to what the Lord might do with that one life if we allow it to be consecrated in Christ's kind of care. You know, the Lord of the universe the one who says, you are so important that I will live for you, I will die for you, I will be raised for you. 
and I will invite you to carry my name into this world. A few days before Christmas, in another area, I had the privilege of visiting with a friend who had had a horrible tragedy occur in their life. Nobody you would know, a situation you wouldn't be mindful of, but due to confidentiality, I will share no specific. And basically, I went to be with that person and just to listen as they began to kind of unpack for me the circumstances surrounding this tragedy. And if that wasn't enough, the idea of those coming to help to provide some answers, to get some clarity about what had gone on wasn't there. It was as if it was all forgotten. Nobody seemed too willing or eager, eager to touch it. And then one day a friend came by. It wasn't me. Someone had come by to say, you are in such a tough place. And the terrain you need to navigate is a terrain that I am an expert at. And it was true. And this person made a remark and said, I will walk with you through this until you have all of the answers and I do not care how long it takes. We will get to the bottom of it. And you will come through this and out the other side and there will be light. My friend said to me several times, can you imagine someone saying that to me? I will walk with you through this. And I do not care how long it takes. So can you imagine that I'm worth that much? And it reminds me wondrously of this very thing that was said to the people of Israel and said to you and to me by our God. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Who am I? You can't separate who you are from whose you are. And given what our God has said about his commitment to your life and mine. In his sight, we must be pretty special. I hope you and I together will spend this year living that way, gratefully, and in a way that gives God the glory, simply by being who you are in his care. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Larry. Let's stand and sing together, shout to the Lord in response.
Some of us still have New Year's resolutions that are good and intact. Some of us, some of us have things we want to do differently this year. Experiences we want to be open to, things we need to leave behind. And a key to that all happening is where you invite our Lord into the conversation of your life. Anytime we gather, we are wanting to be alert to those who have particular needs. You see one name printed, Sarah Waltower. Her family has been longstanding members of Sycamore Church. Sarah lives in another part of the state and was involved in a most serious car accident before Christmas. And she is in a hospital in Columbus and her family is requesting prayers. We also lift up a long-standing member of our church family, Dick Borcherding. Dick is in hospice care. We thank God for his great spirit. And someone many of you would not know, but who has worshiped with us because she's the mother of one of our members, uh, Elaine Fox, uh, who lives in Michigan, is recovering from a recent fall that left her body battered. She has one of these remarkable spirits about her. We pray God's healing upon Elaine and comfort with Dick and healing with Sarah. And we open our hearts to God in prayer. Father, keep us faithful to your leading in this year. We know we often surround ourselves with lots of stuff, but often not the right stuff. We get preoccupied with the currency of our day rather than your currency, which counts. And we have somehow forgotten that our value is nothing that we can ever earn or merit, but it's your free gift. And so give us the grace and trust to lean into your arms. Gracious Lord, bless this, your church. Give us the heart to do the things that matter in this little corner of your kingdom. Attentiveness to lives that may be broken, hopes that may be deflated. Help many to be able to ride and be buoyed up in the fellowship of this church family and give us a deep concern for the well-being of those beyond these four walls as we recognize that our great and wondrous presence may not simply be the things we do, but who we are and who we seek to be in your name. We pray that in this coming year, your world would know more of the aching, beautiful message of peace and that we might do our best in whatever fashion to help it be realized. Give us such a respect for each person that we encounter that we would see in their life one more life for whom Christ has died and be willing to sacrifice. O oh, faithful Lord, buoy us up as only you can. And may our response be that of a faithfulness and devoted care, living to honor our Lord and Savior Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And with great joy, may we continue to worship by sharing in our tithes and offerings.
We have a great privilege to begin this year in our worship time together by sharing in the Lord's Supper. And all who trust in Jesus Christ as Lord of life and as your Lord and Savior are invited to participate. Sometimes we are just struck by what the Lord has in store for us to receive by the generosity and goodness of his care. At this service, we typically do it by an ancient Christian tradition known as intinction, which is something that many may not be familiar with. So I want to spend a moment just to help you understand logistically how you participate. We do it as a group. For all those who are able, we invite you to come forward to one of our four serving stations. There will be two here and then one on each of the side aisles. To participate by intinction, you pick up a little piece of bread, you dip it in the cup, and then you receive it immediately. And if you are not as agile as you think you are and you drop the bread, you are heartily invited to grab another piece and to allow the one you dropped to be committed to the grace of God. Now, how do we come down in front? If you are seated in these two sections, you will come to the center aisle, come forward, and then you will return by the side aisle. If you are seated in our two outside sections, you will come to the side aisle, come down to the station, and then receive the element, and then go by the outside wall back to your seat. As we gather together, we do it leaning into the love and grace of God, remembering that on the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat and do this remembering me. In the same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper and poured it out saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink of it, do this remembering me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And now with a spirit of prayer and expectation, we ask our Lord to take these very common and ordinary elements and to set them apart for God's extraordinary purpose that in receiving them our faith might be strengthened and our lives brought even closer into life with him. Will you please pray with me? Without you, O oh Lord, our lives are empty, futile, hollow. And with your grace, O oh Lord, we are fully alive and we are greater than we could ever be on our own. Come to us in this time and feed us and fill us and make us your own to the glory of Christ Jesus, our loving Lord. Amen. Now, as our serving teams come forward, I also would like to say if there are people who cannot come to one of the serving stations, but you would prefer to be receiving the elements where you are seated, all you need to do is put up your hand and one of our serving teams will come to you where you are so that you do not need to walk. May we join in the fullness of the Lord's gifts to us.
Is there anyone who's not been served? Okay, Sujan. Faithful God, somehow you know exactly what it is that each one of us here needs and that you are the God of the future, already there to make it happen. Give us the trust to follow you and to be lifted into the life that matters because you give it. Each day, Lord, may we live with gratitude in your care to the glory of Christ Jesus, our loving Lord. Amen. Please stand and sing our final song with me. How great is our God.
Since God is great, in his care, our loves become greater than they could ever be on their own. And so what can you do? Go with joy. Live in faith. Believe that life is good. And if you find it not, help make it so. To the glory of God who made us. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, friendship, and power of the Holy Spirit lead us forward together each step of the way. Amen. Thank you.